generally, if a baby has TTN and that grunting and you decide to put them on CPAP, a lot of the times in babies with TTN, you can wean them down to 21%. So they don't need any extra oxygen. Whereas often in a baby with RDS, even if you put them on CPAP, they may still have an oxygen requirement. Okay, that's one way in which these two diseases differ. So transient tachypnea of the newborn or TTN and RDS or respiratory distress syndrome. And today we're going to have a little bit of a fun video because over 10 categories of other ways that they differ, I'm going to describe one of the diseases and you're going to have to guess whether it's TTN or RDS. So let's play this together. Two quick asides. The first one is, as you all know, there are a million reasons why babies might have respiratory distress in the NICU, but these diagnoses are two of the most common. And the second thing is, I want to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Tala. I've been a neonatologist for 17 years. And if you are interested in even more neonatal education than what we have on our regular channel, then think about joining our membership. It's great to have you here. Right, let's start our game of is this RDS or is it TTN? And we're going to start with pathophysiology or what actually causes the disease at like a microscopic level. Okay, which disease is secondary to surfactant deficiency, which results in alveolar collapse, in worsening compliance, so the lungs just become a lot stiffer, in atelectasis, so there's entire areas of the lungs that have collapsed, and in worsening VQ matching, which basically means that you now have areas of the lungs that aren't being perfused adequately. Yep, you know the answer is RDS, or respiratory distress syndrome. And that is the hallmark of RDS, immature lungs that are lacking surfactant. And what's the cause of TTN, or transient tachypnea of the newborn? It is delayed resorption of the fetal lung fluid. As you all know, during pregnancies, the baby's lungs are actually filled with fluid. And after the baby's born, we expect those lungs to work, so that fluid has to go away. The way the baby gets rid of that fluid is kind of in stages. About a third of that fluid is resorbed, like in labor. So even before the baby is born, the fluid and the process of labor starts to kind of suck that fluid back in. A third of that fluid goes away during the delivery process, maybe a little bit of, of it from the vaginal squeeze or whatever as the ba baby's being born. And then the remaining third of the fluid is gotten rid of after the baby starts crying after delivery and opens up its lungs even more. So if the baby hasn't managed to get rid of the fluid for any of these or all of these reasons, then there is still fetal lung fluids in the lungs and the babies will present with TTN or transient tachypnea of the newborn. Two, risk factors. Which of the two diseases has the following risk factors? So late preterm or term babies, C babies delivered by C-section, especially if they didn't have any preceding labor, and babies delivered precipitously, and infants of diabetic mothers. Did you say TTN? If you did, then you're right. Based on what we said about the pathophysiology, hopefully you did realize that this is TTN. If the mother didn't undergo any labor and it was just an elective C-section, then obviously that third of the fluid that was supposed to be resorbed in the process of labor isn't getting resorbed. And then if the baby's just being yanked out via C-section or baby's delivered really precipitously, then it's not getting the advantage of getting that rid of that fluid during the actual labor process. The infants of diabetic mothers actually are at increased risk of both TTN and RDS because it delays the fluid resorption when babies are infant of diabetic mothers. And what are the risk factors for RDS? You all know this, obviously the most important one is prematurity. And really, surfactant isn't made until really late in development. So really all babies that are born at less than 37 weeks are at increased risk of RDS. What are the other risk factors? Well, being SGA or birth weight less than 10th percentile or IUGR, you kind of fell off your growth curve is a uh, big risk factor. The having a male sex, the mothers having an infection are also risk factors for RDS. And importantly, like we said, maternal diabetes is a risk factor for both TTN and for RDS. In fact, 
those like big fat 37, 38 week babies that end up with like really bad RDS and nearly always infant of diabetic mothers. And that is because the high glucose and insulin basically also decreases surfactant production. Another quick aside here, we generally think of TTN as a disease of late preterm and term babies. So for example, say you do have a 23-week infant that was born by C-section for PIH, so the mother was never in labor. So presumably this baby probably does have extra fluid in its lungs, but the overwhelming issue with this baby is the RDS. So we wouldn't even say that this baby has TTN. It honestly sounds funny just even saying that out loud. Three, onset of symptoms. In which disease do these symptoms start pretty much immediately after birth? Yep, you said it right, it's RDS. When the babies come out, the alveoli can already be a little bit collapsed and there isn't any surfactant to open them up. So really from the outset, these babies can have symptoms of respiratory distress syndrome. Whereas with TTN, the lungs are usually well-developed and the babies have no issues actually being able to keep their lungs open and their alveolar open, but they're still not able to get rid of that excess amount of fluid. So sometimes babies with TTN won't present until or won't get really bad until one to two hours after birth. They may still present after birth, but still, if it's a later onset, it's more likely to be TTN. Four, clinical manifestations. Which disease can present with grunting, flaring, retracting, tachypnea, and desaturations? If you said both of them, then you're right. As you all know, when babies get into breathing issues, these are the sets of symptoms that they show. And it's also the set of symptoms they're gonna have if something else is going on, like pneumonia or meconium aspiration syndrome. If you actually listen to the babies with a stethoscope, then in babies with RDS, you're a lot less likely to have decreased air entry, whether it's at the bases or one area of the lung, just because as we said, with surfactant deficiency, you might end up with in entire areas of the lungs that are collapsed. Whereas with TTN, generally the lungs are nicely open. There might be excess fluid and you might hear some kind of crackly stuff, but generally you're gonna hear really good air entry throughout the entire lungs when you put the stethoscope on the chest. Five, response to support. Okay, say that you have a 37-week infant that was grunting and you put the baby on CPAP and they automatically wean down to 21%. Which disease is it more likely to be? You should know this because I started with it. Yep, it's TTN. These babies will generally only have a mild to moderate oxygen need and will kind of pretty much get resolved with like a low flow um, or high flow nasal cannula or a CPAP. Sometimes if the symptoms have gotten away with us and we haven't given them the support that they need, then the TTN may develop into persistent pulmonary hypertension. And then these babies do end up needing a much higher oxygen. But generally in uncomplicated TTN, you can put them on CPAP and the symptoms will resolve and you will, or, or at least on the CPAP, and the FiO2 can be weaned all the way down to 21%. Again, that's because the lungs are well developed and well expanded. They just have a little bit of extra fluid in them. Very different with RDS, where in RDS, you've got the surfactant deficiency, the alveoli may be collapsed, you have areas of atelectasis and you have VQ mismatching. So sometimes even putting them on CPAP isn't enough to kind of open up all those alveoli and get all the blood supply going to the air sacs, the alveoli where it needs to go. Sometimes you do put a baby with RDS on CPAP and it goes down to 21%, but often as well, you can end up with 30% or even higher than that. And as you all know, if there is that persistent oxygen requirement when you're on CPAP, then these babies may actually need some surfactant, or if it gets really bad, they may need intubation and mechanical ventilation to just try to open up those lungs. Six, chest X-ray findings. In which disease do you see the following? Hypoexpanded lungs, air bronchograms, and a ground glass or an overall hazy appearance. I know you know this, yep, it's RDS. Well, what do all of those things actually mean? Well, hypoinflated lungs literally means that the lungs aren't very open. And the classic way that we used to kind of determine how inflated the lungs were, were to count the ribs where the lungs were inflated. 
And honestly, a recent article showed that this probably isn't a very reliable way of seeing how open the lungs are. But right now, it's pretty much all we have. So we're pretty much still using that in the NICU. Generally, a normal lung should be open maybe eight, nine ribs. If the, the lungs are only open maybe six ribs, then you can be pretty sure that these lungs are hypoinflated, for the time being at least. The ground glass appearance, I don't know why that term came about, is just basically that overall hazy appearance that you see in the lungs. And those are just areas of microatelactasis. So just the little alveoli are collapsed everywhere, creating that kind of like whitish appearance of the lungs. And the air bronchograms are when you can literally trace the bronchial tree throughout the lungs. So they look black, and you can kind of follow them out pretty far, the bronchioles. That's because you have the whiter areas of collapse. So the black areas of the bronchial tree are a lot more obvious. Those are called air bronchograms. And we see those very often with RDS. And what we see on chest x-rays with TTN, well, like we keep saying, the lungs work normally. So the lungs are normally pretty well expanded. Sometimes they're hyper expanded because the baby's really trying to open up its lungs to try to like make up for the fact that there's extra fluid in there. So generally these lungs will be eight, nine, 10 ribs expanded and they overall just look wet. So you may see like excess interstitial fluid. So coming out from kind of the middle of the lungs, we can see like a lot of fluid that sometimes is considered to be a sunburst pattern. We can sometimes also see fluid in the fissure and the classic fissure that we see it in is between the right middle and the right upper lobe. And you just see this like thicker whitened marking. Sometimes you'll also see pleural effusions and just with this overall kind of increased fluid, we can sometimes see a really like big fat heart. I will say sometimes you have a 37 or a 36 weaker and you get the x-ray and it looks a little bit hazy and it's eight ribs expanded, and you can't really tell if this is RDS and TTN just from the x-ray. So you go back and look at the history, and then you also just follow the baby's course. If the baby continues to get worse and the FI2 is going up, most likely this is RDS. If the baby starts getting better and all the haziness is gone by like 12 hours of life, if you're repeating the chest x-ray, then this was TTN. Seven, what about ultrasound lung findings? Well, honestly, we're not currently using ultrasounds in our unit to differentiate between lung diseases, but this really looks like it's going to be the future of neonatology, and so I'm covering it here. In which disease would you be more likely to see the double lung point sign or the DLP sign? If you guess TTN, then you are correct. In this paper comparing RDS and TTN, they explain that a DLP is a sharp cutoff that happens when you have more compact B lines in the lower lung field and less compact B lines in an upper lung field. So what is a B line, you may ask? A B line is a vertical echogenic line that indicates the presence of interstitial fluid in the lungs. In this paper, they found that the DLP sign was only found in cases of TTN and in none of the cases of RDS. In RDS, the most specific and sensitive sign was seeing air or fluid bronchograms. So the authors of this uh, study and this paper concluded that really the ultrasound is a very good way of differentiating RDS and TTN. And honestly, based on what we've all seen in the unit, in some of those in-between cases, probably more helpful than x-rays. Eight, clinical course. In which disease would you expect that you treat with CPAP for a couple of days and then the baby is completely better and back to room air? Yep, you know this, it's TTN. So TTN isn't just a clever name, it's transient tachypnea of the newborn. So we know that it is a transient process that lasts until the baby's able to get rid of all the fluid. And generally we will say that TTN resolves within about three days of life. Quick aside, that's if you're giving the baby the support that it needs. 
if the baby is huffing and grunting in newborn nursery for a day and a half and ends up in bad pulmonary hypertension, then obviously we have to get over the pulmonary hypertension as well. So given the support that the baby needs, the TTN will resolve within three days of life. But generally realize if you've admitted a baby with the diagnosis of TTN and the baby is now five days old, and every time you try to take the baby off CPAP, the baby is grunting or desatting or whatever, then you may very well be missing something. Maybe there is a little bit of underlying RDS, maybe the baby has pneumonia, or maybe the baby has something else going on, like a cardiac finding. And I'll tell you, the TAPVR, total anomalous pulmonary venous return, is the one that can most often hide as like a TTN type picture. So if the, C if the TTN is lingering, then consider what am I missing here? RDS, like you all know, has a very different clinical course. And these babies usually are getting worse within the first 12 to 24 hours as their lungs get tired and they get even worse areas of collapse. So often their oxygen requirement will go up. And sometimes these babies need extra support, whether they need to be intubated. Sometimes they will need to be given a dose of surfactant. We generally give surfactant at about 30%. Every unit is different. We also try to give it in a less invasive way, which is also fantastic for these babies because we can put them or really never take them off the CPAP. Sometimes babies will have horrible side effects from the RDS. For example, they may end up developing a pneumothorax or another air leak syndrome, or the babies as well can end up with really bad persistent pulmonary hypertension. So very different clinical course, RDS versus TTN. And as you all know, RDS is never like a two, three day thing. It normally lingers for several days, even if it's like a late preterm baby. And obviously in the tiny babies, it can last days to weeks until we're calling it some sort of other type of pulmonary disease. Nine, the blood gas pattern. Okay, which disease is more likely to have this blood gas, this arterial blood gas on 30% of FiO2? pH 7.11, CO2 of 69, PaO2 of 42 and a minus three. Yep, you guessed this. Much more likely to be RDS because what you have here, you have the high CO2, so you have a respiratory acidosis, the hypercapnia, so this baby just isn't able to breathe out its CO2, and you have the hypoxemia, so the low PaO2 on 30% of FiO2. So this is much more likely to be RDS. Whereas with TTN, you're much more likely to get a very mild hypoxemia. Like we keep saying, these babies often don't need any extra oxygen. They're often just on 21%. And if they do have hypercapnia or an increased um, CO2, then normally it's very minimal. So maybe it's in the mid 50s or maybe in the low 60s right at the beginning and then you check it again and it's already down to the low 50s or high 40s. So normally we have a much more normal blood gas pattern in TTN versus RDS. 10. What is the prognosis? Which of the two diseases can be severe and life-threatening if not adequately treated? Honestly, both can, just like anything in medicine, if it's not taken care of, it can continue getting worse and be lethal. But like I said earlier, TTN can be very dangerous if the baby ends up going into pulmonary hypertension. Most TTNs, even if you're not treating them with CPAP or oxygen or whatever, are not going to get into pulmonary hypertension. Whereas RDS, if it is not treated adequately, it can be extremely severe and life-threatening. And before the institution of surfactant and positive pressure, a lot of babies did die from RDS. For example, JFK's son, Patrick Kennedy, died in 1963 from RDS, and he was born at 34 weeks because it was like the pre-surfactant age. And as we've all seen, even if these babies do get the surfactant and the CPAP or whatever else they need, they're still at risk of getting a pneumothorax or another air leak which in itself can be life-threatening. And as you all know, the tiny babies with RDS can go on to develop weeks and months of lung disease and eventually have BPD or chronic lung disease. So RDS is definitely the one with the worst prognosis. Whereas generally TTN is generally a benign, self-limiting diagnosis and they make a quick recovery. Not to be too negative about RDS, there are lots of babies with absolutely great lung function when they grow up. It just will take longer for them to get there. Okay, that was the 10 differences. Now when you get your next baby 
with respiratory distress in the NICU, you'll have a very good idea about what disease process the baby has or not because babies trick us all the time. If you got this far, then please like this video. And like I said, if you're interested in neonatal education, then please sign up to this channel. Thank you for being here.